ladies and gentlemen, this is Kim C, hostess of the Year of Underrated Stephen King, a one-woman literary book podcast brought to you by a university fiction teacher who pulls the Stephen King titles in the back, back, back of your mind to the front row. Today we have a very special, very unusual, and very big episode, dear ones. But before I talk about how I'm going to break it down, I must explain myself. Lots to explain. Okay. As you all know, or if you're new to the show and aren't quite familiar, this Stephen King podcast likes to focus on the less popular King titles for a myriad of reasons. I'm a treasure hunter at heart. I really like taking a look at all the beautiful writing that isn't explored. And for the most part, I am someone who puts all King titles under a literary lens and I try and take a classroom approach with each story. That's my spiel, that's my thing, and I've been sticking to it for over three years. Now, this year of years, this absolutely wild ride of 2023, I collaborated with a friend and local business owner to do a Stephen King book club, so this provided a more mainstream King title exploration to sneak in and steal my focus from the underrated lineup I had planned. And then, more recently, I had an amazing opportunity to chat with Scott Daly and Dr. Matt Freeman from Kingslingers, and they gave me the most amazing homework assignment I was not expecting. But when Kingslingers gives you a mission, you straighten up and fly right immediately. So I got right to work, threw my stuff in the car, and drove to Derry to work on a full-on 100% reread of Stephen King's 1986 iconic novel of novels, a top five contender in pretty much every single Constant Reader's catalog, the book, ladies and gentlemen, the story, the tome, that is it. Now, as you guys might imagine, I was not planning on doing an it reread at all, but it happened. And suddenly, I found myself with a notepad oozing with scribblings and a fresh take on the story. So, of course, I wanted to make an episode. That felt absolutely essential. But here's the thing, everybody. How does one make a podcast episode on an 1,100-page novel in which everyone and their mother and their mother's dog has commentated on it? Everything to be said has been said. Everything to be thought has been thought. What could I possibly bring to the table? How could I possibly make a dent in this Mount Everest of a book, this monolith that is so large it blocks out the sun? How, ladies and gentlemen? Well, that question quickly started to haunt my sleep. (laughs) About 300 pages into the reread, I found myself wide awake at 2 a.m. trying to figure out how I was going to organize an episode. I only wanted one episode because I didn't want, at this current time, to do a really big multiple episode deep dive because so many friends of mine have done such a brilliant job of that already. Matt and Simon at King Size did some gorgeous work with a five-part read-along and then Kingslinger's. My God, friends, mic drop. 19 weeks. 19 weeks! I mean, gold medal. Full stop. I bow down. Those two, Matt and Scott. To put it simply, princes of a new age. They've ascended the highest level and ushered in a new dawn. Uh, But here's me, Lil' Kim C, bloodshot eyes in the dark of my room, staring up at Goliath, trying to figure out how I could make it work. Because I do want to say something. I do have thoughts to share. But how? But why? But should I? Needless to say, folks, I started to crack. I quickly started to lose it, my guys. Not fun. I was spiraling so bad. I came very close to canceling this whole thing and avoiding a recording about it because it's too much. It was just too much. I was losing my damn mind over all the details. 
until thankfully I managed to claw myself around the cliff edge and out loud tell myself to just shut up and read. Just read. Don't analyze. Don't think about translating it. Just read. Absorb the text. Enjoy the story. Breathe. And I'm happy to report. I did that, everybody. I read my paperback copy alongside the incredible audiobook narrated by Steven Weber, and I made myself a student again. I became a reader again, and it was great. Cut to three weeks later. That's the time it took me to finish this reread. I definitely sunk in deep, spent a lot of time with it, and at the end, I did revisit the idea of recording and had a much easier mental time with it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've decided for this episode, I'm just going to have a really subjective, very personal, completely 100% Kim C. examination of what I thought about this second read-through. I want to recall what's changed since I first read the book. I want to talk about aspects I really liked, things I didn't notice before, I want to openly acknowledge areas of the story I wasn't crazy about or pose some questions. I didn't want to plug in my normal routine of analysis straight on. Of course, I had a real time with this because I love the formula I currently plug in. I think it works. It brings me a lot of joy. It sounds like a lot of you guys like it as well. We take a look at novel strengths, characters, criticism, questions. It's a good formula. But for whatever reason, it just didn't feel like it would work for this episode. That's not to say we're going to be analysis-free. Analysis might still squeak in, but it's not the goal. All I know is that in my mental minefield over the past several weeks, I realized the only way to combat insanity is to just talk to you about this book as Kim C. the reader and not Kim C. the teacher. Granted, the two aspects of self are very, very close, but I want to try very hard to let my readership shine through more so than the professorial role. With that said, everybody, (laughs) to avoid a complete and utter mental meltdown, the best way to go about this is to chat with you like a friend would about my second read-through of this book. As you know, my very first King title was the novella collection Full Dark No Stars in the summer of 2013. I was a fresh graduate from my MFA program with an emphasis in fiction, and I had never, ever, ever read Stephen King in my entire life. And boom, one novella collection opened my eyes to a writer I had misjudged, miscategorized, ignored, and all around just missed completely. And I believe right after I finished Full Dark No Stars, I'm pretty sure I would bet money I went on to Pet Cemetery. I wish I was 100% certain. I think I'm like 90% certain I went on to Pet Cemetery. Yes, I did. I did. I did. I did. Because I had heard it was a very scary King book. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to go in and I'm going to read Stephen King and I'm going to be a reader of his... I need to test myself, and if I can handle one of the really, really scary ones, maybe it won't be so bad. Yes, that's it, guys. I think I was planning to read it straight away, like immediately after Full Dark No Stars, but decided to test myself on Pet Cemetery. Because remember, guys, I'm not a horror reader. The closest I got in grad school was my gothic novels class, and that was the extent of it, and we read some pretty tame stuff. Weathering Heights, Castle of Otranto, Rebecca, Dracula. It was really good, but nothing at the level King was going to take me. So fast forward to the summer of 2014. I read it. I was working for a school I was not crazy about, and I found myself in this sad little teacher's lounge slash lunchroom, and I had this big old hardback splayed out in front of me and I would take the whole lunch hour and just read. I went home and read, I read before bed, and I dragged that book with me everywhere. I think I even took it to a hockey game. (laughs) Not my proudest moment, but I was hooked by then. 
and it took me about six weeks to complete. When I was finished with the book, I thought about this vivid moment from one of my grad classes. One of my professors, brilliant man, never forget it, he told the class that good books make us want to return to them again and again, but great books, great books change you. Great books change you. And he asked the class if we had ever been changed by a book. And I thought long and hard and heard my really pretentious classmates say, Moby Dick changed me, to which I had to stifle my eye roll. No judgment if Moby Dick did in fact change you. It's possible. It's great. But come on. (laughs) But I really shouldn't talk. Because sadly, the only book I could think of, I was way too embarrassed to mention. But I'm going to tell all of you because I can't see your eyes rolling out there. The book I would say changed me is one that I read at the tender age of 15 years old, and that was Danielle Steele's 1992 novel called Jewels. And it had, as the kids would say, an absolute chokehold on me, and it's true. Oh my guys, I admit this with such shame, but I'm totally just laying out all my cards for all of you. I had never before in my life woke up at four in the morning so I would have two to three hours to read before school. This stupid romance novel compelled me. I read it all the time and when I wasn't reading it, I was thinking about it and creating extra scenes for the characters. I was obsessed. I couldn't stop. Looking back, I really believe that might have been my first adult book which I know is strange. I know a lot of Gen X and millennials out there got their hands on adult material a lot earlier in life, but I was maybe not that ready to grow up. Unsure, all I know is that I read a lot of YA and then suddenly puberty happens and I found myself really curious about sex, of course, when in reality, I probably should have just sought out direct smut for efficiency. (laughs) Because for those of you who aren't familiar with Danielle Steele, there ain't nothing real sexy going on, guys. She's like the bell pepper level of spice. All of the romance in her novels is the fade to black kind. Danielle Steele stories are always about rich, beautiful people and their drama. But I don't know, guys. Danielle Steele, late 80s, early 90s, that lady was spinning out straight fire. And Jules was this epic family saga about World War II, and they opened this jewelry shop to help the families after the war. Oh my god, I had never read anything so consuming before. And soon I would discover that her writing style wasn't as robust as it could have been. In case you guys didn't know, I actually love this, but Danielle Steele novels are usually read by those who are practicing their English. Those who have English as a second language, if you are an ESL instructor, get some Danielle Steele novels. They're wonderful tools to practice because her writing is very simple, very clear, a lot of telling instead of showing, which is the first rule of fiction, avoid telling, more showing. So there was really only a very small window when I thought she was the greatest writer ever. I actually think it would be that summer after I finished that Danielle Steele book where I would have to read The Scarlet Letter and other classics for my advanced lit courses. And yeah, I quickly observed, okay, Danielle Steele is not a high caliber writer, but boy, did her story have me by the throat like nothing else did. So naturally, I could never admit out loud in front of my grad student classmates that a book by Daniel Steele was a book that changed me. Can you imagine if I did? Oh, (laughs) I shudder to think, everybody, the looks I would have received. I would have been judged forevermore and it would have scarred me for the entire two-year program, but it would have been true. Oh man, guys, I was a little freak with that book. I just felt like I was floating. Not because it was some great romance. I was just so wrapped up in the story. The story of this family, the story of what was happening in the country, the whole world I was consumed. Anyway, I mention all of this because after I finished it for the very first time, I wish I could time travel back to Professor Olson's class 
and raise my hand and say, yes, Professor O, I have been changed by a book, and it's the novel It. And I would tell Professor Olson and my entire English 459 class that at the end of It, I felt like I had traveled somewhere. I felt like I had experienced something profound, very unique, very personal, and it left a mark. On paper, it's this immense good versus evil journey with these amazing characters as both children and adults fighting to save themselves, save each other, save a city, but off the paper, it channeled something very deep in me. It allowed me to confront a lot of my own childhood fears I had thought long buried, and in the end, it revealed to me what fiction can be. At 15 years old, I was awakened to how fiction can make you feel. But when I was 27 years old in that crappy teacher's lunchroom at a school I don't have fond memories of with that tattered hardback in front of me day after day after day, I was awakened to what fiction could be. I learned it could be a mansion of brilliance and time and emotion. And after two degree programs filled with hundreds of stories, all the classics, Brit lit, American lit, South American, African, European lit, multiple book clubs. Nothing had left such a crater-sized impression on me as it. And overall, nothing has moved me as much as Stephen King's writing. And that kind of awareness, ladies and gentlemen, it changes a person. It is a great book, and it is one that changed me. I know it's dramatic to say and think about, but I think, personally, I have a lot of evidence for it. It's a game changer of a novel. So in regards to this second time around, I was very surprised that at the end, I had a bit of a book hangover. It surprised me, guys. It really did. I have talked about this story here, there, and everywhere with so many people. I went through the reread kind of fast, but then... When it was over, that sudden hollowness where the story was alive in my heart and a part of my day-to-day, -day, I was waking up and recalling what chapter I was at, thinking back to the previous chapters, it's there and it's with you. And then all of a sudden it's done. And dang, the emptiness. I know I sound really melodramatic. This entire intro is very melodramatic and has been for the last several minutes, but you guys get it. You guys are readers of King your King fans, and you know it can be like that sometimes. Moving on <laughs> to wrap things up on this very long intro, this is going to be a different kind of episode. If you are very new to the show, I recommend hopscotching around before you listen to this one just to get a good feel for what we do here. This episode is not really going to contain the usual analysis that I like to provide. We're going to have a little analysis, but it's mostly going to be a subjective impression after this second read through almost 10 years later. I wanted to provide a very personal take on this most excellent, very impactful novel, which is why I'm calling this episode It, Then, and Now. If you plan on sticking around, please note that I will most likely not be avoiding spoilers. This episode will assume you have read the novel, that you've seen the films, you know the characters, you know what I'm talking about in regards to the plot, you know what happens. If you've never read the story and you've only seen the films, I would maybe wait on this one. It might not be the best move. However, whatever you want to do, I invite you to stay regardless, in the hope that we might have a shared experience together. All right, my guys, the novel It is a 1986 publication, the year of my birth. I'd like to say it was a lucky one. <laughs> it took King a little over four years to write it, as it was started in September 1981 and finished in December 1985. It clocks in, at least according to my 2016 all-white Scribner paperback, I've got 1,153 pages. I, like many constant readers out there, have multiple copies of this book. I am a firm believer in the shelf copy and a reader's copy. In our next section, we're going to talk about what this second read-through was like, what I gravitated towards, what I noticed. Usually, I would have novel strengths and characters 
and I will. They're going to be there. They're going to be all mixed up in the cake batter. They'll just be present in a different form. But for whatever reason, everybody, as I mentioned, the mental mania was no joke. And this deviation from my normal routine feels like the right road to take with such an exceptional story. And if there is an outcry for more, I'd be happy to record another episode on it, where we do a traditional analysis in the go-to Kim C format. But in order to not lose my marbles, this is how we're gonna do it. All right, lovies, we've returned to Derry. It's time to take a walkabout on these old streets, jog our memories. I'll see you in the next section. Let's start the show. Before I dig into this very large Jade of the Orient meal, I must declare I had such a grand time on this second read through. I noticed a lot more little things and really mulled over some of the bigger things. Can't wait to talk about it. Let's do it. This novel has 23 chapters divided into five parts. We have five separate dairy interludes with micro chapters attached to the 23 chapters. It is a vast, sprawling epic. This novel is a mansion of many rooms, incredibly vast, absolutely impressive. Within this section, we're going to mention a few categories that floated to the surface, pun intended. I know that was low-hanging fruit, but I had to do it. On the second read-through and pair them with what I thought about the first time I read the novel almost a decade ago. Nine years to be specific. And our first category is Mike's Time to Shine. When I first read the novel nine years ago, I definitely, like many first-time readers of it, gravitated toward the children in the story. I think that every single one of those kids was in hyper-focus for me, but because this story begins with young Bill and young Georgie, I instantly attached myself to Bill because he endured what my worst fear was as a kid. I stuck to Bill like super glue because he went through everything that terrified me as a kid. And to illuminate that a little bit, I know I chatted with King Size about my love of Bill Dunbro sometime last year. But because this novel is about childhood, I think it only fitting to share a few details about my own childhood. I am the oldest of three children. My parents both worked full-time jobs, and once my second and third brothers were born, I was a full-on big kid by the age of nine. By nine years old, I had two siblings to look after and be responsible for when my parents were gone, and I did it well. I was really responsible and good at it, cautious, definitely mature for my age. But I think that being that little with that much responsibility, in retrospect, it contributed to a lot of anxiety. I was constantly afraid that something would happen to my brothers. If they rode off on their bikes down the street, I was convinced I was never going to see them again. They were going to get kidnapped or just disappear off the face of the earth, and it would be all my fault, all my fault, and my parents would hate me forever because I lost them, and this was a regular spiraling thought process of mine, friends. And it wasn't just with my brother, sadly. 
if my mom was late to pick me up from school or my dad was taking a while to fly in from a business trip, I was convinced they were dead, especially my mom because she had headaches a lot. I was just always convinced that they were dead and I would never ever see them again and I would spiral, spiral, spiral. Unfortunately, this was almost a daily occurrence, this crippling fear. And as I look back, I most likely very much uh, should have been on child Lexapro or something, my guys, because wow, I was not okay. But it was the worst when it came to my brothers and if they were at a friend's house or down the street or at the skate park, oh man, I would just find myself completely unraveled to a shaking, sobbing mess and everyone just thought I was a worrier and I just needed to relax and be positive and not focus on bad things. But that awful brain dread was so much of my childhood. And thankfully, yes, I do have beautiful memories of childhood, lots of family fun times, my parents are both still married, and I grew up in a really safe and loving home. But at its heart was this beast of terror all the time, every day. And it didn't really go away until after high school because by then it warped into something else when I got to college. But yes, my childhood sadly equaled crippling anxiety because who knows? The fear of loss, the lack of control, it sent me into a very dark place for many years. And when I first read this book, here was this character named Bill who survived my worst fear. He lost Georgie, he blamed himself, his parents became super distant and detached and borderline catatonic. Here it was, every single fear I ever had crashing around my brain, it came true for Bill. And I was completely consumed and mesmerized by the young boy and who he grew into. Ergo, I fell in love with Bill Denbro, and he quickly became my favorite Stephen King character based on how much I saw myself in him and how much I could hypothetically understand his dread and his doom and his broken heart and the drive to destroy the monster so more families wouldn't feel the loss he felt. I was 1000% on board with this guy and felt like I wanted to be his best friend. And some of my favorite parts in the novel have Bill at their center. I love this guy. I love him. And even with this second read-through, I found myself wiping away tears at several scenes when Bill is at their center, especially during the Georgie confrontation, which appears at the end. And it's meant to be a very horrifying, terror-filled scene, but it's actually very emotional for me. But I love that concerning Bill, his loss is what makes him the leader of the Losers Club. Because death specifically visited his house, his grief is a huge asset for him. It's motivating, it gives him greater insight, and everyone looks to him to lead them because he stands out. He's the sort of alien of the group because he's been forced to to go to a place no one else has. No one has been as directly affected as Bill, therefore he's really elevated to Big Bill because of the pain he's endured. When I think about it, it's just really fascinating and very, very poignant. This time, ladies and gentlemen, because it's been nine years since I read the book, to my surprise, Bill wasn't really in the spotlight this time. Although I very much still love Bill with all my heart, as I really, really love every single member of the Losers Club with all my heart, this read-through, I found myself really gravitating toward Mike Hanlon. Yes, sweet, precious, brave, determined Mike. I was so into Mike's journey this time, guys. Every time Mike Hanlon was on the page, I was enraptured. I feel the richness of his character was really revealed to me this second time around. Mike is, of course, the only member of the Losers Club who remained in Derry when everyone left. Everyone scattered from Derry more or less within five years from the summer they were all together, and they headed out into the world and became super successful, lots of fame and fortune, but Mike stayed behind as this tormented lighthouse keeper to learn the secrets of Derry, to unlock the past, gather data, 
and eventually be the rallying beacon and summon everyone back. He has such a difficult job. Mike lives in this tiny little house, makes next to no money as a librarian. There is no mention of romance. I know that he's into somebody that he works with, but it's definitely unrequited. And of course, no children to speak of, which we find out in the novel that everyone in the Losers Club is barren for extended reasons and connections down the road. They're all kind of locked together in this decades-long mess. More on that later. But Mike is a tragic character, but a compellingly beautiful character. Oh my gosh, friends. His father, Will Hanlon, is also awesome, and there are some beautiful and terrible areas of the book where Mike and his family are really integral to the dark history in Derry, and it's, oh god, it, ugh, emotionally, it really hurts, and it's very haunting, but so incredibly powerful. So for whatever reason, I'm still trying to figure it out, Mike was in the foreground for me, and Bill was slightly off to the side. I was super focused on Mike and his position, and was so fascinated because Bill may have been the leader for the Losers Club in 1958, but Mike Hanlon is definitely the leader in 1985. He's been the watcher and waiter and the data gatherer, living amongst the death and the disappearances and biding his time until he knows the inevitable will come and he'll have to make those six phone calls. He is amazing. He really always has been amazing, but I didn't observe that on the first read through. And now I'm 37 years old. And for whatever reason, Mike absolutely became everything for me in this novel, friends. I admire him. I cheer for him. I think he is such a noble, brave, and solemn character who brings such gravity to the story. And I think this is the first time I really saw him and understood his importance and power in the story. He goes through such harrowing personal adversity as a kid with Henry Bowers, it's awful, so much abuse, and yet he stands. He's loyal and strong and so admirable and sober, ladies and gentlemen. We don't really have any details of Mike coping with all this dread at the bottom of a pill bottle or a steady cannabis habit. I mean, applause right there, because if I were Mike, I definitely would have picked up some unhealthy coping mechanisms to get through it. But Mike doesn't, because from my impression, he knows the mission is too important for him to get foggy, and he is tasked with being the anchor for everybody when they all return. It is such powerful stuff. Now that I'm thinking about it, I know that there is one area, I think it's Dairy Interlude 4, when Mike is writing and he's very drunk. I don't balk at that in the slightest. He deserves a night off, and he can't even really enjoy it, of course. He can't really let himself relax because he's writing as he's drunk. He's writing the manifesto. He's got his police scanner on. He's constantly surrounded by the dairy disasters. So even when he's three sheets, he's still doing the work. I mean, what a guy. What I find really interesting is that I don't often hear Mike mentioned as often as I would like. I understand why. When Mike is mentioned, I think it is with a lot of reverence and respect, of course, but I just find that he's not talked about as much as some of the other losers, and it makes sense. He is more of a quiet presence, and he's in the shadows, in comparison to Beverly and Richie and the others but he really glowed very bright for me this time around. And Mike definitely reminds me of an Old Testament prophet. For anyone who is a biblical scholar out there, I think it fits. The Old Testament has some really powerful, amazing prophets, but if you guys didn't know, or if you remember from Sunday school, they didn't really have the best job, and nor did they often have good news to share. Most of the time, Old Testament prophets were given revelations from God on his incoming judgment, and they had to tell all the people in town that they needed to repent or they were going to get smited, thrown into Babylonian captivity, the plagues of Egypt were going to get released. They had a really crappy job, my guys. 
and an even crappier message to deliver. And these prophets often grieved the position they were in. It was a heavy, heavy burden to carry. And if you're interested in further research, the prophet Jeremiah is a good and sad one. He had a very somber message to deliver to Israel. But anyway, Mike totally reminds me of an Old Testament prophet. There's a heavy burden on his shoulders and he carries its weight every single day by existing in the town all his friends have vacated. There's nothing blooming there for Mike to pursue and to enjoy. It's a dead, dry place with literal bodies piling up. And he has to learn about all the terrible things that have happened in this place over generations, as well as coexist as it happens again and basically dedicate his life to the second battle. So powerful, my guys. I cannot wave the Mike flag enough. I really got time to think about his character this time around, and it was just astonishing to observe everything that he sacrifices in his life in order to keep the lighthouse lit so they could come back and finish the mission. So incredibly moving. I was freaking obsessed with Mike Hanlon on this second read through. And really quick, before we move on to our next category, since I mentioned biblical stuff, guess who surprised me as quite the Sunday school scholar? Guys, Richie Tozier knows his Bible stories. It's a really small part shortly after they go to the Aladdin to watch the Wolfman picture. I think it's Bev, Ben, Richie, and Eddie. Afterwards, Bowers chases them. But right around that scene is when we learn that Richie goes to church a lot. I'm sure he's forced to, of course. And his Bible knowledge is quite impressive. I would have never associated that with him, but it's totally true. But yeah, totally missed that on my first read through. Richie goes to Sunday school. (laughs) But to segue into our next category, Mike Love will definitely bubble up more as we go along. But overall, I was incredibly moved and touched by what an amazing character he is. And I hope that in future, there are more people who notice that. Our next category is the Dairy Interludes. We have five dairy interludes in this story, and these are present-day moments with adult Mike Hanlon interviewing people in the town. He also interviews his own father on the history of dairy. And unfortunately, it's usually pretty dark stuff because, as we know, this place ain't right. This place ain't a good town. Inside the five dairy interludes, we have the burning of the Black Spot nightclub, the murder shootout of the Bradley gang, the barroom axe attack from Claude Harrow, as well as numerous other isolated child murders that have been happening in Derry for decades upon decades upon decades. We also have the Kitchener Ironworks explosion in the early 1900s. And from these Derry interludes, we come to learn that all of these tragedies occur in 27-year increments. Each dairy interlude peels back more layers on how this town has been afflicted with this evil entity since things started to get written down in the 1700s, and you can bet money the native people were most likely also tormented before the Europeans arrive. As we learn more about it towards the end of the book, yeah, it becomes very apparent just how much this region has been suffering in addition to the end of the novel really illuminating the nature of this entity and what exactly we're dealing with. I don't really think I appreciated the dairy interludes as much as I did this second read-through. Of course, to my happiness, there is a ton of Mike Hanlon in these parts, which is also a huge plus, but in addition to that, as you all know, I just read The Shining for a second time a few weeks back, And one of the critiques I had about the story was in regards to the nature of the Overlook Hotel. I really didn't get the source of its accursed nature. What is really going on there, guys? It can't all be from Horace Derwent. So what is it? Seriously, I had a lot of questions because I felt there were a lot of blurred lines on the source of its power, its motivations, and what the power current running through the hotel to make it so evil. What was it? tell me. But what I absolutely love about the Dairy Interludes is that it gives me an ample helping. (laughs) It provides 
me so much evidence to where I have zero doubt what's wrong with dairy. It is so clear. This place has been effed up for generations upon generations, and each dairy interlude lends to Mike's investigation that something evil, something powerful, something that hibernates, something very ancient is in this town, and nowhere else in the country is it this damn bad. And I feel what King does with the dairy interludes is everything I wish would have happened in The Shining. Granted, I don't think The Shining novel should be changed at all. I'm fine with where it's at, but boy, do I wish we had more Overlook content that sheds light on exactly what went down in there from when it was built to when the Torrances arrive. For the novel It, King really languishes in just how this town is cursed as hell, my guys. He opens up the main small town community and colloquialisms and lets those older citizens really reveal the ugly times and how over the years it all gets covered up and dismissed and kind of buried. I love what King does with small towns and secrets. Check out the miniseries Storm of the Century if you're into that as well, but I really relish the dairy interludes this time around. It provided such an interesting balance to have these intervals where we pause from the Losers Club and deviate off the trail to this really fun historical place where we spend time in Derry with Derry citizens and observe that, quote, things in Derry have never been right, end quote. And it's so true. It's so true. It's so present, completely legit. The Derry interludes really shone bright for me on this second read through. And the Losers Club almost became a bit secondary, or rather sharing the foreground, instead of being directly in the middle. And that's because I found these interludes so strong. They deepened the richness of the novel, and when I first read the book, I couldn't tell you much about the parts that didn't directly impact the seven characters we're following the most, but this time, I really paid attention, and it was such an awesome experience. I would say if you can't immediately recall what went down in the dairy interludes, let's open your copies and skip right to them because they really, really deepen the terrible climate that dairy exists in and how this rather septic evil has deep, deep roots in the history of this town where atrocities occur on the regular. Super rich, my friends, and I often feel these areas get overlooked and it's easy to do with the huge character cast we have. That's why this novel is so incredible, because we have it all. We have these wonderful slices on the history of Derry, Mike's character collecting all this data, and then we're juggling between two time periods with a cast of characters we absolutely adore. It's just beyond words. Before we hit our next category, we must read a slice from this gorgeous text. This is from the very powerful and revealing Dairy Interlude 4, and it shows Mike in all of his amateur detective glory. Once more, this is in the 2016 Scribner paperback on page 907, and I have a post-it note marking my spot that says, Mike H. being a star boy, <laughs> and I think that's incredibly accurate. Here we go. I turned off my tape recorder and just sat looking at him for a moment this strange time traveler from the year 1890 or so, who remembered when there were no cars, no electric lights, no airplanes, no state of Arizona. Pennywise had been there, guiding them down the path toward another gaudy sacrifice, just one more in Derry's long history of gaudy sacrifices. That one, in September of 1905, ushered in a heightened period of terror that would include the Eastertide explosion of the Kitchener Ironworks the following year. This raises some interesting and, for all I know, vitally important questions. What does it really eat, for instance? I know that some of the children have been partially eaten, they show bite marks at least, but perhaps it is we who drove it to do that. Certainly we have all been taught since earliest childhood that what the monster does when it catches you in the deep wood is eat you. That is perhaps the worst thing we can conceive. But it's really faith that monsters live on, isn't it? I am led irresistibly to this conclusion. Food may be life, 
but the source of power is faith, not food. And who is more capable of a total act of faith than a child? But there's a problem. Kids grow up. In the church, power is perpetuated and renewed by periodic ritualistic acts. In Derry, power seems to be perpetuated and renewed by periodic ritualistic acts too. Can it be that it protects itself by the simple fact that, as the children grow into adults, they become either incapable of faith or crippled by a sort of spiritual and imaginative arthritis? Yes, I think that's the secret here. And if I make the calls, how much will they remember? How much will they believe? Enough to end this horror once and for all, or only enough to get them killed? They are being called, I know that much. Each murder in this new cycle has been a call. We almost killed it twice, and in the end we drove it deep in its warren of tunnels and stinking rooms under the city. But I think it knows another secret. Although it may be immortal or almost so, we are not. It only had to wait until the act of faith, which made us potential monster killers as well as sources of power, had become impossible. Twenty-seven years. Perhaps a period of sleep for it, as short and refreshing as an afternoon nap would be for us. And when it awakes, it is the same. But a third of our lives has gone by. Our perspectives have narrowed. Our faith in the magic which makes magic possible has worn off like the shine on a new pair of shoes after a hard day's walking. Why call us back? Why not just let us die? Because we nearly killed it. Because we frightened it, I think. Because it wants revenge. And now, now that we no longer believe in Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, Hansel and Gretel, or the Troll under the bridge, it is ready for us. Come on back, it says. Come on back. Let's finish our business in Derry. Bring your jacks and your marbles and your yo-yos. We'll play. Come on back and we'll see if you remember the simplest thing of all, how it is to be children, secure in the belief and thus afraid of the dark. On that last one, at least, I score a thousand percent. I am frightened. So goddamn frightened. Oh my goodness. Friends, how do I articulate the master? I, I can't, of course. But the reason why I chose that scene, we are on page 907, my loves. And throughout the progression of the novel, we have just been across 27 years of this and that with all of these people. And yet on page 907, Mike is talking about making the phone calls. The non-linear structure of this narrative blows me away, you guys. I am gobsmacked by what this guy does with structure in this novel, the powerful, poetic exploration of evil within this town. I can't even. I'm just, I'm a puddle. So I love that scene so, 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 so much. I have one more tiny little topic before we head out of here, and it's called Get Your Hands on the Physical Text. For our last category in this chunk of the episode, we still have more chunks, of course, but for the last one in this spot, let's talk about italics. As many of you know, I'm someone who practices having the physical copy in front of me with the audiobook going at the same time. It's definitely the only way I pass grad school, so to anyone who can't focus for crap or whoever is craving a richer reading experience, I highly recommend. So I had my big 2016 Scribner paperback on my lap, and one thing I completely forgot about on the first read-through was King's use of italics. Many moons ago, if you guys remember, I did an episode on Misery, and it's probably to date. This one could beat it, but... It's one of my longest episodes, but I remember echoing how important it was to get the physical text of misery in front of you when you read because there is so much font art inside of it. We've got the missing letter N on Paul's broken typewriter, lots and lots of handwritten finger painty freaky things, scrollings and etchings on walls, lots and lots of word art everywhere. It's amazing. And so the italics within this novel, wow, it, I'm just, 
I have to talk about them with you because I can't figure them out. I, oh, okay, let me back up a little bit. As you all know, italics are used to place emphasis on something, and what I teach my students is that they need to use italics to reveal the inner thoughts of a character. They can also be used for song lyrics, letters, but basically, italics are present for anything that isn't uttered with the human mouth. (laughs) If it's not coming out of a human mouth, we should probably use italics. So what was really wild for me is that King has italics everywhere. We have entire chapters written in italics, which kind of gave me pause because I couldn't really understand the connection. At first, I thought, oh, the italics mean it's in present day. Present day 1985 is in italics because that was the pattern I was noticing at the time. Modern day Eddie, modern day Richie, modern day Bill and all them, all of their sections were written in italics. So that was my first thought. Oh, it indicates present day, whereas non-italics or regular font means 1958 dairy. Okay, got it. Problem solved. Except that didn't work. That wasn't the case because then I found that there were italics in 1958. My other hypothesis was, oh, there are italics used if you're away from Derry. If you're outside of the city of Derry, it's in italics. I was convinced I had it right. Bingo, I'm done. No, my guys, no. Because when we're in Derry, there are italics. So uh, I, I don't know. My only thought now is that, bless him, King wrote this over a four-year period and lost track of his motivations for the Italian. I I don't know. So if it's not indicating present versus past, and it's not indicating in dairy versus not in dairy, I don't know what it is then. But I'm convinced it's got to be something because they're so prevalent throughout the novel. Everywhere. I don't think it's past versus future. I don't think it's childhood versus adulthood. I, I don't know. It very well could be that they're a haphazard accident (laughs) and he just decided to use italics for his own amusement. It very well could be that. So I really need everybody's help. If you could please take a gander through your physical copies of the book, notice how prevalent italics are in this text. Let me know if you've cracked the code or the pattern, and please tell me immediately. I'm on Instagram. The show's email address is underratedsk at gmail. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter, formerly Twitter, now X. I need your help, H-E-L-P, in regards to whether or not this is just a haphazard typing whimsy, (laughs) or if there's actually a pattern connecting the use of italics in this novel. I love it. It makes me lean in, and I was becoming very detective over the whole thing, trying to make notes on when the italics were featured, what was going on when they weren't featured, but I'm really scared that King just didn't give a crap and he just turned the setting on and off at his leisure. So (laughs) I kind of need everyone's help. It would be so great if we could do a little bit of detectiving and maybe connect the reasons for the heavy, heavy use of italics in this novel. It is such a masterful work. It is an epic. It's an iconic novel. I want to know as much about this book as I can. This is a very large part of it, and it most likely has been mentioned on other podcasts. I just haven't found the answer yet, but if you guys could give me a clue, throw me a bone, I'd be immensely appreciative. Okay, my guys, I think it's time for a little breather. We need to digest our food and walk around dairy. We need to jog those memories. And remember, let's hit the streets and I'll see you in the next section.
Okay, buddies. To recap our previous section, we discussed Mike Hanlon's Time to Shine, the Dairy Interludes, and what is going on with those italics. Before we get into our second section, I have to tell everybody that the other day I had my first Pennywise nightmare. In actuality, it's my first Stephen King-related nightmare that I can recall. It really happened, and it was so creepy, I woke myself up. Thankfully, it was a short one, but in the dream, I have a vivid memory of everything that went down, which is rather surprising because I no longer remember my dreams, but there was this middle-aged man who appeared out of nowhere, and I looked at him and asked, who knows why I did this, but I asked him, are you Bob Gray? And then suddenly, he's right in front of me, and he puts both of his hands on either side of my head and starts to squeeze. And then, all of a sudden, his face morphs into Pennywise. And this Pennywise was kind of like a hybrid version of the new Pennywise and 1990 Tim Curry Pennywise. It was wild. And I tried to get away, but he held me in place. He was so strong. He was squeezing the sides of my head. He had this evil, evil grin. And the next thing I remember is that it's 1 a.m. and I'm blinking myself out of it. And my heart is pounding, pounding, pounding. And that was it. I ripped myself out of it. That has never happened before. I've never seen Pennywise in a dream at all, ever. Was not expecting it. Here I am with all my analysis and all of my literary pursuits, and I got sucked into it and received a pretty good fright. Pennywise got me. What can I say? He had me in his literal clutches. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that happened. (laughs) I think that means I'm doing something right if it bleeds through. Although I'm not eager to repeat the nightmare, I'm okay it happened. This second section is going to explore the second half of the novel because, wow guys, we have so much dense, layered, important content toward the second half of the story. And of course, the last 100 to 200 pages are insane. Pure insanity. In my humble opinion, by the time you get to chapter 23... I feel like King hits hyperdrive and we head into deep space. More on that later, but the next two categories we're going to talk about are supersized. I definitely think you could take these next two categories and pick them apart for weeks and weeks and weeks. They're just so immense, so vast, so much to say, so much to uncover, but we're going to make a dent in them now just to get a few things off my chest. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. The fourth category of this episode is Miss Beverly Marsh. Everybody, we gotta talk about Beverly. I know I praised Bill and Mike a lot in our first section, but I think it's critically important to talk about Beverly because she is one of the most iconic Stephen King females. She is beloved the world over, but I find I'm a little bit of a unique ducky in terms of how I feel about Beverly. The first time I read the novel, I definitely isolated her as a very special character because she is the only girl and therefore everything she does is in hyperfocus. But I do remember being really put off by the dad stuff. It was icky, icky, icky. And the way the narration consistently discusses Beverly in a sexual way. Now, let me really emphasize that I don't think the narration heads in a perverted direction, but if you notice the content surrounding Beverly, everything, everything is about her body. No one in this novel gets this much attention on their physical form than she We never ever hear about any of the boys experiencing hair growth or body stuff, and that's because they're not quite at the door of puberty, more on that later, but everywhere in this narration, it's all about Beverly's physical form. Her burgeoning chest and her long legs, her blossoming beauty, this gal is nothing but her parts on the page. And we see this a lot with King as a red-blooded male writer, 
But also, he's not alone. Numerous male authors who consistently mention what a woman's breasts are doing inside her dress. It's not unique. (laughs) He's not alone in this. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I accept it. I'm not against it, nor am I necessarily for it, but I respect the author's decision to be who they are when they're writing. But what I'm trying to say is that I think because Beverly is 11 years old and because this is such a long novel with a multitude of male perspectives, I remember thinking during my first read through of the novel, how I wish everyone would just leave her alone. Leave Beverly alone. Even the nice stuff and the kind stuff, and there is a lot of beautiful, friendly interactions with Beverly and the boys. There are. It's special. It's great. But compounded, it's too much. Too much focus on her body, and I think the infamous scene I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes really nailed the lid on the coffin in terms of leaving her alone. Ergo, what I think happened to me personally is that I wanted her to be left alone so much that I, in fact, ended up leaving her alone in my own thought process. I ended up focusing on other characters. And I know that's crazy. When I think about it now, it's nuts. I don't really know how it happened, but that's the only logical explanation I have for why Beverly is never really at the forefront of my mind. Everyone raves about Beverly, But when I thought about my memories concerning Beverly, nothing really stood out in terms of her individual character attributes, but only the trauma she suffers. Regarding Beverly, I remember she's a crack shot with a slingshot, which is really helpful to the group. I remember she likes her cigarettes, which at 11 is great and total rebellion, and that she has a tiny crush on Bill but every boy in the world has a crush on her. And that's about all I associate with Beverly. That's all I could recall. And if you jump back to my absolutely stellar Kingslinger interviews, when I was chatting with Dr. Matt Freeman, he absolutely hit it on the head in terms of what's going on with Beverly. I asked him, Dr. Matt, why do you feel everyone loves Beverly? And I think I was asking about that subconsciously because I genuinely want to understand the devotion she receives from the masses. And he absolutely hit it on the head. He said, it's because the readers end up wanting to defend Beverly. We love her because we want to take care of her and protect her ourselves. And that's it, folks. That's exactly where I feel all the Beverly love is centered around. It makes complete sense. So I took what Dr. Freeman said into this second read through and realized that Beverly's pain affected me so deeply the first read through that I kind of said to myself, in a way, I can't save you, Bev. I gotta say myself, so I'm just gonna hope you make it out of here because you're strong and you're older than me in this scenario, so good luck. I just wish everyone would leave you in peace. And after that first read-through, I ended up letting Beverly fall from my mind because I didn't really know how to feel about this character. All I knew was that I wanted her to be left alone. I wanted her left alone so she could figure things out without someone commenting on her body, her beauty, and how at the center of the Losers Club, she's everybody's sexual awakening. And even with her toxic, disgusting father, she's the source of sexual attraction, which begets his abuse. So much happens to her And I didn't really get to see her shine through all the muck. Because for me, things just keep happening to Beverly. The narration doesn't give her a lot of agency because she's too busy helping others, being at the center of someone's gaze or fixation. There's not a lot where she's just completely free. Now, with this second read-through, I had a lot more pity for Beverly than I had the first time. 
I really noticed the way she appears in the story, the way she is described as being present in everyone's mind. It's sexual, guys. It really, really is. As sad as it is to say, and as sad as it is to keep harping about it, it's a thing. It's always about her body, never her personality, never her character. Now, it's okay. I'm trying to balance this to make sure I'm not coming across too one-sided. That was the author's decision, and I think it works because Beverly doesn't necessarily have to be the well-rounded, complex female heroine we have in more contemporary stories. I think within the last 30 or 40 years, our average heroines are very, very different. And on this second read-through, looking at Beverly, she strikes me as very similar to Susan Delgado from Wizard and Glass. For those of you who haven't read Wizard and Glass, definitely make it a priority because it's wonderful. But she is the beautiful damsel in that novel, and so is Beverly in this novel. She's the beautiful damsel at the center of many men. Going to lit class really, really quick, out of the feminine archetypes, of which there are seven, and the seven are, for your reference, the mother, the maiden, the huntress, the mystic, the queen, the sage, and the lover. They're all based on female goddesses, of course. Check those out if you're interested in more. But our Beverly is 100% the maiden. She is innocent and caring and good and the least experienced out of all the archetypes. She is beautiful and special because of said innocence and sweetness, and this, of course, makes her incredibly vulnerable to victimization. That's Beverly, our innocent maiden. Looking at Beverly the second time, I found her to be more of a symbol in this story than a complete character. She is symbolic of beauty and blossoming womanhood in female sexuality, she represents an idea more than she actually is a multifaceted character in this story. I know it's a lot, guys. It's a lot to chew on, but think about it. I would have loved if we would have had more time with Beverly as a woman who enjoys textiles, because you guys, how did she get into dressmaking? Dear listener, tell me how. I don't know, but I would love to know. I feel the other losers, for the most part, we get a good connection of the things they're into and how that translates into an adult career. Ben can build stuff. We see this when he helps make the dam in the Barrens and he builds them a clubhouse. He becomes a star architect. Stan is prim and proper, tidy and organized and logical, very factual guy and he goes into the field of insurance. Bill has lived a horror story and wants to share the horror with the world, so he's a novelist. My hypothesis on why Eddie is a limo driver is that it keeps him away from people's microorganisms because he's separated by glass and distance, but later, when they're all in the sewers, we discover that Eddie is actually really savvy with directions, so driving and routes make sense. But what do we know about Bev aside from what happens to her, my guys? I'm surprised she didn't have a career being a marksman, hitting a target for cash or something. Why dresses? I mean, there's nothing in this book that leads to liking clothes. And I'm so obsessed with wanting to know more about that. Do we ever see her sewing? Do we ever see her plug in that interest at all, making doll clothes or when they're washing the bloody rags at the laundromat? Is there anything that goes down with that? No. And I think that's a missed opportunity, especially because we have two occurrences where Beverly's blouse fails her. If you guys remember when Pennywise surfaces in the house on Kneebolt Street and they have the first silver slug and slingshot moment, I don't know, they're running around, stuff's happening, and all of a sudden, Beverly's blouse like rips open, exposing her in front of all the boys. She does not have a training bra on. Side note, was this necessary? I don't think so, but 
In that same scene, I did enjoy the kindness that Bill demonstrates because he removes his shirt and gives it to her. Granted, she asks for his shirt, but we do establish that Bill and Bev have a little bit of a connection and their mutual crush feelings on each other. I get it. But yeah, we have multiple occasions where I just wish Beverly had a damn blouse that had latching buttons, this poor girl. And maybe her love of fashion came from the fact that her shirts failed her all the time. I had a lot more pity in my heart this time around for Beverly. And I think overall, that's how I feel about Bev. There is pity. There is heartbreak. Because as an adult woman, she married her father with the disgusting example that is Tom Rogan. And she allowed herself to be really hurt, emotionally abused, because that's the only kind of love she's known. Because her father worried a lot and his worry equaled love, really, really messed up stuff. And then at the end of the novel, she and Ben find each other and it's touching and sweet. But the character of Bev just disappears into another relationship that I feel was more of a reward for Ben than it was for Beverly. Not to say Bev is against it, I don't think she is, but man, this gal doesn't really have a lot of room for herself. And I understand I'm bringing that conclusion from a 2023 societal perspective. Whereas in 1986, a happy ending for Bev on the arms of a good man, perhaps the man she was always destined to be with all those years ago, that's what King wanted for her. And I respect that. But I think with what we know now in 2023, for the most part, is that love isn't quite enough when you've got a lot of broken stuff inside. And I think King highlights that. We have this amazing scene toward the end of the novel when Bev has this huge realization of how she allowed herself to be abused by Tom. She did, in fact, marry her father. And she's screaming out to everyone around her, I married my father. Who does that? Why would I do that? I believe this scene is really, really close to when everybody is getting ready to make their final stand in the sewers. They're at the Derry townhouse. This is when everything really starts to ramp up after Henry Bower shows up and attacks Eddie's room. It's right around that area of the story. And the 1990 miniseries showcases this moment rather well. If you jump over to the 1990 miniseries, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. It's a scene with Onette O'Toole, who plays Bev, and John Ritter, who plays Ben, which, speaking of the 1990 miniseries, Beverly Marsh is played by Annette O'Toole, who is absolutely stunning and perfect. And did you guys know... Annette O'Toole played the main character of Sarah in the film version of Jules. Remember at the intro, my 14-year-old novel obsession? Well, it was so good, it blew everyone's minds that they made a miniseries of it in 1992. And yeah, it's all connected, loves. It is all full circle for Kim C. It's all connected! Isn't that amazing? I digress. Okay, based on the text... I'm walking away from this story convinced that Bev did get her happy ending based on the fact that it slash Pennywise is defeated forever and they all get to start again victorious and the past just got erased in the flooding of dairy and all the pain is gone forever like a true magic wand sweep. That's the only way I can step away from the story with confidence that Bev is going to be all right. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the first time I read this book, I had complicated feelings about Bev. And on this second read-through, I still have complicated feelings about her. But I'm happy that with this second go through the novel, I find myself nearly a decade older really wanting to fight for her because of everything that happens to her. And I'm okay with that. I'm happy with the visceral reaction I received. I like Bev a lot, and I understand her importance in the realm of king females based on how she makes us feel. It's fascinating, guys. I've been in my head about Bev for a long time, and I don't know if everything I said is making sense. It might not. That's okay. 
it's a lot of ideas. It's a lot of theories. All I know is that this lady makes me feel very scrambled. And that's a good thing. Now that we talked about the bumpy gravel that is the character of Beverly Marsh, let's talk about sex. Let's talk about a few of the sex scenes we have because I think they're important. If you have young listeners around you, I would not listen to this if they're present. I think it might be a smart thing to not have this on if anybody's under the age of 13. Just a caveat to everybody out there. Usually, I don't really go into explicit territory. However, I have to. That is the name of the game. And with this fifth category, it's called the sex talk. We have two-ish sex scenes in the novel It. One of them is a consensual scene between adults, and said adults are adult Beverly and Bill. And the second scene is not not consensual, but it's very different. So before I get into that very large helping of controversy, I'm actually going to explore the Bev and Bill affair. As we know from the text, these two are both married. One seems sort of happy, married to film actress Audra, and Beverly is most definitely unhappily married to the abusive maniac that is Tom Rogan. Throughout the novel, we learn in the 1958 dairy portions that young Beverly is attracted to young Bill and vice versa. Mind you, according to the text, once more, these two characters are 11 years old in 1958, which, if my calculations are correct, would put them at the top of sixth grade. As in, in the fall of that year, in the fall of 58, they should be sixth graders. I'm also pretty sure full-on puberty is about two years off, but there are definitely sprinklings of it. So in the story, Bill and Bev, as kids, are attracted to one another and in 1985, they reconnect and end up having a pretty passionate consummation of that long-forgotten attraction. And friends, I'm a romance fan. I think that it can really deepen a story when it's done right. And I thought this was a pretty good love scene, folks. Granted, I'm not into extramarital affairs within character relationships, but... I think because these characters are locked into this terrible trauma bond and everything's been frozen in time until they return to Derry, it seems like they pick up right where they left off, only now they have adult bodies. So I was actually okay with everything that happened. Even though it is kind of icky, Bill is of sound mind and makes this decision knowing he is going to cheat on his wife. But he and Bev have this thing, and coming back to Derry is a supernatural thing for everybody involved. I liked it. <laughs> On this second read-through, I still liked the scene. I felt it was sexy, and that it had the right amount of emotion, and it was well-written. Only this time, because the ending with Ben and Bev seems very left-field. Well, it's not necessarily left-field, but it's abrupt. Because if you think about it, Bill and Beverly have a passionate sexual experience. I really enjoyed the way it was written. But at the end of the novel, Beverly ends up with Ben. But we didn't really have a lot of flirtation between them in the story. So it does seem a little thrown in there at the end. I'm okay with it, absolutely, because deep down the reader knows they should have always been together. Ben's been in love with her since day one. So with that in mind, I kind of wish the love scene would have been between Ben and Bev rather than Bill and Bev. That way, at the end, when Ben and Bev drive across country together, it seems par for the course because they were able to have a passionate encounter with each other. So like I said, I really like the love scene. I'm a big fan. But now, having read the novel twice, I wish it featured different characters because, my guys, if we would have had the love scene with Ben and Bev, whew, the fire, oh my god, all the love and desire, think about it. Everything pent up, that would have been electric. Okay. <laughs> Deep breath. Now, 
I must talk about the most infamous, most contested, most problematic and hot topic scene in the entire novel. It seems King has recently commented that at the time, no one really said anything about this scene during pre-publication, the editing process. In 1985, apparently it was not a controversy. It did not pose a problem which is rather fascinating to me. But my hypothesis is, this is just a stab in the dark, but Stephen King just wrote an 1,100-page novel that took him four years to write. And those around him might have been a bit on the sycophantic side. No offense to them, but who is going to question Stephen King, the most popular writer on the planet, and you, a plebeian, are going to question the content? Absolutely not. No one in his immediate circle was going to say jack crap. They were not going to say anything, not a single word. That's why I think that happened. Nobody said nothing. <laughs> I don't know if I would have either. Would you tell Da Vinci to fix a part would you tell Michelangelo, hey, I think you should edit this part out? No. That's what happened, guys. Pretty sure. Okay, my goodness. How do I do this? All right. Everyone, to put it simply, the first time I read this scene, I was shocked. I did think it heinously inappropriate. But also, I didn't know what to think. It was a wow, in all caps, and not a good wow. And over the years since, I've poked fun at it like a lot of us do. And to my shame, I've probably used crass language to talk about it with others. But weeks after I finished it for the first time, I do remember questioning the reasons why. Why did it have to happen? Why did he put that scene in there. Why? Truly. To what end? For what purpose? And at the time, I was so in love with the story, I became a huge apologist for the text when I decided in my own brain that here's what he must have been thinking. In order to escape the sewers, in order to win and stay alive and kind of live to fight another day, they had to sacrifice something. The Dairy Interludes teach us that Pennywise slash it requires sacrifice. And in order to sacrifice something, because they're dealing with this ineffable entity down there, they had to have sex as a sacrifice of their childhoods because they all had to pay a price, pay some kind of toll, if you will. And surrendering childhood was the toll. As I say that out loud, I'm not sure it really works, but that's what I thought at the time. There has to be a super big reason why this happened, why this shocking, jarring scene happened. And it must have to do with giving something up in order to win. I definitely don't feel that way anymore, but on this second read through, when I ran into the scene again, I was dreading it. I knew it was coming up, but I read it a few times. I read it slowly and cautiously and kept everything out of my mind when I did. And on this second read through, the only thought I had was how unnecessary it is. Unnecessary, ladies and gentlemen. Now, hear me out. When I say unnecessary, it isn't because I'm coming from a puritanical place that is anti-sexuality or censorship focused. That's not it at all. But Beverly is the one who initiates it and says she knows a way to bind them together again because it's the only way they can find their way out. She also puts forth a rather shocking line that her, quote, father told her this. And I take that to mean her father must have explained that sex bonds people because I don't actually think he showed her. More on that in a minute. But anyway, this sexual event is after they encounter the entity that is it. 
and they're on their way out of the sewers, they get horribly lost. It's dark, there's no more matches, and Beverly starts to summon the boys one by one to have sex with her. Based on the narration, it is a pleasurable experience for Beverly, and there's a continued metaphor about birds taking off and landing. It is, for the most part, a scene that it's not gratuitous. There is some diction that lend it to be something nice, something tender. And after all the sex has concluded, Eddie nonchalantly says to the group, Oh, I know. We went too far. We should have gone left a few turns ago. And that ends the scene. So for me, subjectively, personally, for me, the reason why the scene doesn't work is because, A, why is their being lost a symptom of their disconnection? That is thrown in rather suddenly. How... uh, Okay, they're lost, so that means they're disconnected? That means their power as a group has waned? We don't have any textual evidence to support that. B, couldn't the same togetherness have been achieved if they held hands again? Or at most, a small kissing session? Like, maybe kissing the boys? Or, I don't know, it it is kind of a fluid exchange. Less intense, less insane. C. Why did Beverly, a very non-sexual person in this story, automatically go to sex as a way to bond? Why would her little mind go there? It's really out of character for me. She's not a sexual person that we know of from the text. We know that a lot of sexual stuff is thrown at her, so she is kind of inundated by it. But if we look at all areas of the Losers Club in 1958, there isn't a lot of sexuality explored in this novel from her or the boys. It's hinted at a lot, but there are no explicit depictions of really going there. In the 2017 It Chapter 1, the film plugs in Beverly's menstruation, but we don't have that in the novel. We don't really have anything sexual that Beverly experiences on her own. My thought is that if sexuality between these characters wanted to be explored, we needed to have it featured earlier in the novel. So remember what I was mentioning in regards to how old they are. 11 years old, almost 6th graders, most likely. And for those of you who have children or don't, 11 is real damn young, my friends. I know this world is rather fast, and the internet doesn't help, but 11 is not 13. Puberty isn't really on the menu yet, and that's what's problematic about this scene. I'm not saying sex is impossible at 11, because it definitely is. Sadly, anatomically, it's possible to have sex at 11 years old. But if earlier in the novel we had characters who were having wet dreams, or experimenting with masturbation, or looking at pinup mags, I know we have one scene with Bowers and Patrick Hockstetter that's illuminating, but our characters, our Losers Club, never once explore their sexuality other than thinking how pretty Beverly looks and maybe once or twice there's a thought about her chest and her long legs. That is the extent of their sexual focus because that's what the narration provides. It's more soaked in youth and not really the prepubescent, pubescent youth. And my guess is, is that I think it's because they're too little. If they were preteens, this would be entirely different. If we would have had Beverly in her room by herself, attempting slash exploring masturbation, or looking at her body in a bathing suit for long periods of time, if we would have had menstruation featured, which I know is a huge part of the novel Carrie, If that would have been something she was owning and figuring out all on her own, that would have been something. But we can't have that in this story because she lives with the predator who is Alvin Marsh. So Beverly was under a constant cloud of fear over her own body because of the way her father interacted with her. And speaking of Alvin Marsh, I started to mention this earlier. I know the sexual abuse is hinted at a great deal, 
But it's my opinion, this is just from what I got from the text, I don't think it happened. Only because of that scene where it's toward the end when he's possessed by Pennywise and it's really, really bad, he said he wanted to make sure she was intact. It's a very, very icky scene and he ends up chasing her out of the house, but Beverly also realized that her father was completely gone. And if you guys haven't read the novel in a while, Beverly's mother is alive and he's regularly having sex with the mother. And so I go back to what Pennywise actually tells Beverly in one of the moments. I think he's speaking to her from the drain and he tells her this. Pennywise says to Beverly, pardon my language for what I'm about to say, but I'm directly quoting the text. He beats you because he wants to fuck you. He wants to. Key phrase there. Therefore, I don't believe Beverly has been sexually abused by her father solely based on what the text provides. I could be wrong. I could have missed something very, very telling. I could be wrong. Pardon me if I am wrong. But based on what I gathered, I don't think it's happened yet. So to tie this into what I'm trying to say is if Beverly hasn't received any kind of sexual abuse for Beverly in the sewers with the boys to step into this very mature and sexually aware persona, it's a tough sell for me, guys. It's very hard to believe. This young gal that is laying on the sewer floor with visions of birds in her mind, I was so disconnected. It wasn't Beverly. But, 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 <laughs> I also understand as a reader that once we get to the ritual of chewed in chapter 23, <laughs> which I do think it's chewed and not chud because hello, did anyone go to German class, guys? There's an umlaut and those two dots make an oo sound. It's not motley cruh or crewy. It's motley crew. <laughs> it's not uber. It's uber. Although I actually think uber took off the umlaut. Anyway, if it really is Chud, I apologize. And I also apologize that I said Cuthbert and not Cuthbert in my Wizard and Glass coverage. Giant faux pas there. I'm so sorry, DT fans. I digress. Back on track. By the time we get to the 23rd chapter, which is the ritual of Chewed. Holy crap, my friends. It's as if this entire novel gets sucked up into a parallel dimension. And in a way, under the sewers of Derry, it definitely becomes a very topsy-turvy Willy Wonka Dr. Seuss land down there. Guys, the ritual of Chewed is the most insane chapter ever. Having said that, I do have radical acceptance to suspend my disbelief and say maybe the sewers are magical from head to toe and these kids aren't their normal selves in there. And maybe this is just a part of that strange sewer world. I can think that. I can let go. But man, when it comes to the sex scene with Bev and the boys, this second read through for me, it's so out of Bev's character, and it's jarring, out of nowhere, disjointed, disconnected. And my guess is that King wanted to pair the, quote, doing it analogy with it, the being, the entity. That's my guess. I have problems with it, friends. It feels like it doesn't belong, and that's not just because of the shocking nature of it. I think if it would have been edited out, the story would be stronger for it because this is the climax of the book. After a thousand pages, we get this odd, 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 unnecessary scene that I believe, even though the text doesn't show this, it's just another thing that happens to Beverly. Yes, there is sweetness and tenderness, and she loves them. They love her. She feels safe, but she's 11 goddamn years old, you guys. Also, if we're gonna go there and, quote, be together and, quote, bond, why didn't they all have sex with each other? Right? Why was it just Beverly who's receiving that? You could bond if they all had sex with each other. 
it's a troubling, explicit thought to have, but there you go. And this is why this scene absolutely throws a wrench in my bike spokes, and I simply fly off the handlebars. To conclude, I am not a fan of this scene at all, based on its unnecessary nature, but I can't move the master's hand in the slightest. So therefore, I accept this novel with the scene, and that's that. With the scene as a part of the book, I accept it, and it makes me think about it 10,000 times more. It elicits a huge emotional response. That's what great books do, right? Back to what I said at the beginning, it changes you, it rewires you, it opens you up to something so much bigger than you imagined, and therefore, I kind of applaud it for that. King is his own wild gunslinger, and I respect him for all the Bachman renegade writing. I get it, I get it, I get it. All right, lovies, we are going to take a quick little break. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite moments in the book, I definitely have to mention it before I forget. I think I see Patrick Hockstetter driving up the road in a very cherry red 1958 Plymouth Fury. He's coming to pick us up and give us a ride to the Dairy Townhouse, and I think we should take him up on it. After all, it is a beautiful car. I'll see you guys in the next section. Dear listeners, this will be our last section of this episode. We've had a long journey, a lot of personal ruminations and thoughts. In our last section, I discussed my complex yet tender feelings for Miss Beverly Marsh. We threw a little sex in there, and now I have just a few more things to plug in as well as some movie talk. I did rewatch the 1990 miniseries and It Chapter 2, which was released in 2019, because according to my reading, that one seems to be the most problematic of the two films, and in my personal opinion, I would agree with that. So I have a few thoughts on both before we leave Derry for another long sleep. My first category in this fourth section is Echoes of Different Seasons. For those of you constant readers out there, you might be aware that Different Seasons is one of those novella collections that is a real treasure, pure and simple. It contains some of the most rich Stephen King titles in the bunch. We have Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, The Body, The Breathing Method, and the disturbing but fascinating Apt Pupil. This collection was released in 1982, and of course... It is being composed in 1981 until 1985, so there may have been a few echoes, and I wanted to bring those to your attention because on this second read-through, now that my King reading list has expanded, I noticed them and connected them and wanted to bring them up here. 
Firstly, Gordy's family unit from the body is super similar to Bill Denbro's. If you guys remember the body, our main narrator is Gordy Lachance, Gordy Lachance, who reminisces about a summer in Castle Rock when he was a kid, and he and all his friends go on an adventure in the last days of summer to see a dead body. We find out from the plot that Gordy is pretty much ignored from his parents because they're grieving the loss of their older son. Based on my memory, unfortunately, I don't recall what Gordy's older brother died of, but I know it was tragic and unexpected, and his parents were so grief-stricken, they kind of went on autopilot and completely forgot about their younger son and his needs. This reminds me of Bill's predicament so much, and I think Gordy Lachance and Bill Denbro are parallel characters. When you put them both side by side, we have a ton of similarities. Gordy, of course, grows up to be a writer, which is a really big and reoccurring trope in King's work, so no surprise there. Bill is also a writer. They both lost brothers. They both had parents who didn't have the emotional capacity to care for them anymore. So as I was paying attention to Bill's home life, I was thinking about Gordy and connecting those two young men. Another different season's connection involves Apt Pupil, which isn't my favorite novella to discuss, but thankfully my memory of that disturbing story hasn't really changed much, and there was a key scene in Apt Pupil that is a definite parallel to Eddie's story in It. So the It scene I'm speaking of is when we're spending time with Eddie, and this is pre-broken arm. I believe this might have been attached to chapter six, one of the missing, or chapter seven, but Eddie's by himself. He finds himself alone one day. I think everybody else is busy or doing other things, and he wanders over to the train yard. And of course, one of the ways that it slash Pennywise tortures Eddie is with his fear of disease, germs, getting sick, because Eddie is raised by a hypochondriacal mother who terrifies him about everything being a risk. So naturally, Pennywise takes the form of a leper, which is a person afflicted with open sores and oozing wounds and full-on infection. But there is also this really disturbing scene that I wrote down and it stuck in my mind because it connected me to apt pupil. When Eddie is at the train yard, there is a homeless person there who ends up being the leper and he gets really close to Eddie and propositions him for oral sex. And it's really gross, my friends. I personally hate that. Anything with sexual violence and children really irks me, really frightens me. But what made the scene tolerable is that as it was happening, I suddenly realized, oh, 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 I've seen this before. I've heard this before and I've been here before. And it was with that psycho Todd Bowden when he was at the train yard in his novella, That is Apt Pupil. Todd's scene is toward the latter half of the novella when Todd really starts to step into the shoes of being a killer and he heads to the train yard to find some fresh meat. And of course he does, but before he picks his target, the homeless person at the train station says something very similar to Todd. He wants to give him oral sex for mere pennies. It's really gross. It's very crass and inappropriate. And Todd quickly kills him. It's really grim and unsettling, as the entire novella is. But fast forward to Eddie and his leper, and even though it's a Pennywise illusion, it's the same scene. And I connected those two fictional moments right away. And I don't know, guys, there might need to be an entire fan fiction spinoff where Todd Bowden was possessed by Pennywise or something because it tracks. It works. It could definitely work. Another thing about Eddie Kasprak I wanted to mention was the fact that Eddie's father died. I was thinking about this because in the earlier sections, I mentioned that Bill became Big Bill and the leader of the Losers Club because His home experienced direct loss and death, but I realized that isn't true. 
Eddie's father passed away of some kind of degenerative disease. I really should have wrote that down. I believe it was cancer. I'm 95% sure. And it makes a lot of sense why, is it Sophia? Sophie Kasprak? Eddie's mom, it would make so much sense that that's why she is the way she is. And I think that's something that's kind of forgotten with Eddie's character. But this time around, Eddie really struck me with the additional layers he has. I like that he is the smallest in stature compared to the other kids, but he is still a little spitfire, especially when it comes to defending himself from Richie's taunts. But there is so much more depth to Eddie than I originally thought. I don't think I saw Eddie with such depth and power as I did on this second read-through. I think King uses the physical size of Eddie's mom and later on down the road, Eddie's wife Myra to kind of emasculate Eddie and humiliate him that he is so subservient to these large women, but there is a lot more there and I think we really observe this in the isolated scenes with Eddie. When he wanders to the baseball field, the train yard, and of course the broken arm scene with Bowers, there's a lot of strength there. But I think a lot of us, including myself, forget that Eddie had a dad that died. And I wish this would have been enhanced in the narration, because in a way, he too is emotionally traumatized by death and loss only it doesn't get as much attention as Bill's loss does. One more Eddie thing before we head out. I got to, I am compelled. Friends, I have a real problem that Eddie's body was left in the sewers after he passes away. It really shatters my heart. Of course, logically, I understand it, but I also kind of don't. We know that the losers were really deep in there. And there's a possibility that where they were at in the sewers won't exist anymore due to the potentially supernatural nature of the sewers. But come on, they can't send a team in there or just go in there with some flashlights and some supplies and pull them out? I understand they most likely wouldn't slash couldn't explain to anyone else why their friend died slash disappeared in the sewers because there would definitely be too many questions. But honestly, let's remember, there probably wouldn't be a lot of questions because we have a ton of dead dairy residents due to the flooding and the death of it, which pretty much took out large chunks of the town's infrastructure. If you guys remember, there is fire, floods, explosions, earthquakes, biblical acts of destruction go down in Derry. So I think it would be explainable that Eddie was collateral damage, even with his missing arm. It was possible. They could have got away with it. They could have figured it out. Because sadly, I think of Eddie in the cold and in the dark. And yes, I know, I get it. He's dead. His spirit has left his body. But still, I do have... A rather controversial hypothesis on why this happened, and it is such a stretch, but hear me out. Okay, we know, at least a lot of constant readers know, it's been discussed a lot over the years, and on many, many podcasts, it's a very fascinating topic, and if you're not aware of it, I suggest you become aware of it sooner rather than later, but King is very unkind to characters of larger body sizes in his stories. He seems to, textually speaking, go out of his way to shame them, demean them, make fun of them. He really is quite a bully with them, and there are dozens and dozens upon dozens of direct examples to prove this. And this is just not a -a once-in-a-while thing, my friends. It is all the time, and it's not aging well in King's writing. And so my thought is, this is such a hot take, this is, wow, okay. But my thought is that because Myra was a really desperate, whiny, overweight woman who couldn't live without Eddie, dot, 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 well, 
Eddie is the only one of the Losers Club who dies and makes her a widow completely alone and destitute. And in that regard, King sticks it to her. You know, she's someone you could tell he doesn't really care for or respect based on all the time we have with her on screen in which the worst of her character is being shown. So yeah, I know that's... uh, It's out there. It's pure conjecture. It's a total guess and really a stretch. I know this because I'm sure Myra wasn't a thought at the end of the novel at all when Eddie makes a very heroic and brave stand against the monster, but he dies and his body is never retrieved. And I thought to myself, poor Myra, she's never going to know what happened to him because the Losers Club They're all rapidly forgetting everyone and everything. How sad. It's most likely not true. The whole sticking it to Myra just because she's a very overweight, unattractive character. But what if it was? What if it was, ladies and gentlemen? That would be really ice cold. (laughs) I really wish... We could have had a very poignant funeral scene or just a mass grave scene where Eddie is buried with the other victims of the dairy flood, the dairy earthquake, the dairy explosions. So Myra could at least have his body and know that he was a victim to a tragic act of God weather event that killed many people and not just Eddie. I would have liked that. What I don't like is thinking about the fact that he's still down there. It chills me. I'm not pleased with that at all. Eddie deserved better. And even though on the page, Myra seemed like kind of a pathetic leech of a person, she doesn't deserve not knowing how her husband died and where his body is just because she's a certain size. Cold, cold, cold! Okay, buddies, that one's definitely going to (laughs) be something we all chew on for a while. But this next category, it just thrills me. And before we head out of here, I need to talk about it, especially before we talk about the films. I wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing our next category entitled The Eater of Worlds. All right, if all of you can head to chapter 21 under the city. In my version, this is found on page 1023. We are at the tail end of the book. We are about to wrap it all up, but oh my goodness, friends. What blew me away about this chapter was, one, I completely forgot about it on the first read-through, and two, after a thousand pages, we actually hear from the monster. This entity that has worn many masks over its thousand-page iterations, suddenly talks directly to the reader. And it's not the clown. It's not the leper. It's not the wolfman. It's not any dairy citizen it possessed. It is the being who, according to the text, has been around since the universe existed. And what blows my mind. I feel very similar to how I felt when I read book five of The Gunslinger, when Roland finds out what the Dark Tower is, and my cerebral cortex liquefied by what I learned. This is that same kind of feeling, guys. For 1,000 pages, I have seen these children tormented by these various incarnations of this terrifying monster. But then, when we get to chapter 21, we realize that this ancient, ancient, ancient being is this great darkness who is sophisticated and vulnerable. And King gives us a little hint of this in chapter 15, The Smoke Hole, where Richie and Mike go into a little bit of a trance and they head back to the beginning of time when the Earth's crusts were still forming and they're basically looking down at Derry when it was a lush tropical rainforest and they get a glimpse of this being 
this giant, enormous it coming to earth. And then when we get to chapter 21, it all clicks together. And suddenly, those thousand pages of these children being terrorized becomes 10,000 times bigger. Because then this entity is animal, old, wise, powerful, and I don't think of the clown anymore. I think of an ancient alien. And after a thousand pages, guys, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to end this story. But what King does is open the hugest wall-sized door, is sort of telling the reader, oh, you think you're done? We're just getting started. Get ready for your brain to liquefy. And that's what happened. And then we find out in chapter 21 about the turtle. The turtle is the light to the darkness of it. And the turtle is this ancient universal being. I'm not sure when or where we find out his name is Maturin or Maturin. I'm assuming that's Dark Tower and I just haven't got there yet or I forgot I got there. (laughs) Unknown. But guys, I just need to read a little bit of chapter 21 because I am such a fan of the structure of this novel and that by the time we get to page 1023... King blows open our minds with what we thought Pennywise was, what we thought all of this was, and everything just gets expanded. Everything becomes deeper, darker, sci-fi, and I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed with the layers and the deep depths. You thought it was a clown? No, my dudes, not just a clown not just a monster, not just a dreamy Freddy Krueger projected image. No, 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 no. So much more. So let's hear from this entity. I can't wait to share this passage with you. It's flipping nuts. I'm going to read just a tiny slice of this because I'm in love with it. Go to page 1023 or chapter 21 under the city. It, August 1958. Something new had happened. For the first time in forever, something new. Before the universe, there had only been two things. One was itself, and the other was the turtle. The turtle was a stupid old thing that never came out of its shell. It thought that maybe the turtle was dead, had been dead for the last billion years or so. Even if it wasn't, it was still a stupid old thing. And even if the turtle had vomited the universe out whole, it didn't change the fact of its stupidity. It had come here long after the turtle withdrew into its shell, here to earth, and it had discovered a depth of imagination here that was almost new, almost of concern. This quality of imagination made the food very rich. Its teeth rent flesh gone stiff with exotic terrors and voluptuous fears. They dreamed of night beasts and moving muds. Against their will, they contemplated endless gulfs. Upon this rich food, it existed in a simple cycle of waking to eat and sleeping to dream. It had created a place in its own image, and it looked upon this place with favor from the deadlights which were its eyes. Derry was its killing pen, the people of Derry its sheep. Things had gone on. Then, these children. Something new. For the first time in forever. When it had burst up into the house on Niebold Street, meaning to kill them all, vaguely uneasy that it had not been able to do so already, and surely that unease had been the first new thing, something had happened, which was totally unexpected utterly unthought of, and there had been pain, pain, great roaring pain all through the shape it had taken, and for one moment there had also been fear, because the only thing it had in common with the stupid old turtle and the cosmology of the macroverse outside the puny egg of this universe was just this. 
all living things must abide by the laws of the shape they inhabit. For the first time, it realized that perhaps its ability to change its shape might work against it as well as for it. There had never been pain before. There had never been fear before. And for a moment it had thought it might die. Oh, its head had been filled with a great white silver pain, and it had roared and mewled and bellowed, and somehow the children had escaped. But now they were coming. They had entered its domain under the city, seven foolish children blundering through the darkness without lights or weapons, it would kill them now, surely. It had made a great self-discovery. It did not want change or surprise. It did not want new things, ever. It wanted only to eat and sleep and dream and eat again. Following the pain and that brief bright fear, another new emotion had arisen. As all genuine emotions were new to it, although it was a great mocker of emotions, anger. It would kill the children because they had, by some amazing accident, hurt it. But it would make them suffer first, because for one brief moment, they had made it fear them. Oh my, oh my gosh. <laughs> Can you imagine? I'm speechless. After a thousand pages, we get this boulder dropped on us. And then the ripples in the water become hurricane waves when we realize that this entity has a form, a giant insect, for those of you who remember. Very, very similar to Shelob for my loader fans out there. And that is the physical form of it, but yet this ancient, powerful, alien being is so much more than her physical form. Oh my god. I, I, I just, by the time I got there in the novel, I was so amazed. I was so impressed by what he was doing with this monster. This monster is so complex and layered and impressive, and I was just blown away. I really, really love what goes down in chapter 21, Under the City, and I love that we think everything is going to get wrapped up, and for the most part it does, but not before King plants this spinning top of craziness. It just makes me think, what is the origin of it? Was it always, always... <sighs> anyway, my brain became scrambled egg, and I'm a really big fan of that chapter. Okay, we are burning daylight. Let's talk about some film adaptations. This is our last little chunk. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think I can come back at a later time and give these films greater attention and analysis. I would definitely like to do a greater deep dive on these adaptations, but for now, I want to throw a few things out there. I watched the 1990 miniseries because it's really iconic for me and I find it closest to the source material. I also really like that it showcases the 1950s. I was definitely a little bummed that the newer film versions went straight to the 80s and I love the 80s so much and I'm okay with it, but I love the 50s and the 50s is really integral to this novel with the cars, the fashion, the greasers. It's all very integral to King's work and his own childhood, so I kind of wish that would have been preserved, but I'm open to the fact that the two chapters of the 2017 and 2019 It films do a great job of opening up the story to a brand new audience, a brand new generation. That's huge, and I will give it props for that. For the 1990 miniseries, some of the things I loved... I love Jonathan Brandis. He was such a childhood crush of mine. He is the actor who plays Bill Denbro, and rest in peace to Jonathan Brandis. That actor, sadly, is no longer alive, but yes, I definitely had his posters up on my wall when I was in third and fourth grade. He's so cute. He's forever immortally so cute, and I think his performance as Bill was really spectacular. 
He definitely reminds me of a young River Phoenix when he stole the show in Stand By Me for his portrayal of Chris Chambers. If you haven't seen it, please watch it ASAP. So heartbreakingly good. Also, Tim Curry is just amazing. Icon status, guys, you know this. I love this miniseries because for the most part, it really was the first step for so many King fans. They saw this miniseries on TV, whether they were old enough or not, and they became King readers after. So because of that, it's a real gateway for so many. And I definitely enjoy the casting decisions, but I'm sad they made Eddie's character a little more pitiful as an adult, bless him. He didn't have Myra as his wife, but he lived with his mom the whole time, and he perished as a virgin. Very sad. I understand, but I was sad for Eddie. Also, I think Annette O'Toole is just a beautiful Beverly. I love her performance. I'm really pleased with the casting and overall story. And I think the performance I'm the most pleased with is Tim Reed, who plays Mike Hanlon. I really love how his portrayal is kind of understated, humble, quiet, and very dignified. He doesn't really come across as manic or desperate, and I just love his assuredness, his confidence, and his very quiet leadership. It gives the role of Mike a lot of power and agency, that no one should pity him, and that he is in control despite feeling very out of control. It's really massive. He does a terrific job as Mike. Mike Hanlon, speaking of, I can't sing enough of his praises, but he's definitely why I skipped It Chapter 1 and headed right into It Chapter 2. Generally, I remember enjoying It Chapter 1, and I thought it was a nice introduction to the story, and I loved the casting, no problems there, but sadly, I have some issues with It Chapter 2, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Once more, I also enjoy the adult Losers Club casting choices. I think they're solid and very good, but I'm a little displeased with a couple things. Here are my gripes. The actor Isaiah Mustafa plays Mike Hanlon, and I was a little upset that unlike Tim Reed's very regal and dignified performance of Mike Hanlon, Isaiah's performance is reduced to a really desperate, dishonest, conniving, manic individual who is a really shitty communicator. There's no other way around that. And he keeps secrets from his friends and he endangered all of their lives. I'm sorry. I, I, that's where I put my foot down. The Mike in the novel would have never done that. Over the years, he gathered so much data and had all his ducks in a row before calling everybody. And it starts off okay. Mike in It Chapter 2 seems like he's got everything together. But then, once they're at the Jade Orient, he becomes so jumbled and desperate and seems just as lost as the next person. And yes, this is highly believable. He's terrified. It can be explained that he's just reacting to being super freaked out, but ugh, it doesn't really work because I was craving a character performance with more of a solid foundation of the mission instilled within him. For me, there should have been more of a calm understanding of what needed to be done. In the novel, Mike's the one who organizes the dinner at the Jade Orient, and he knows he looks super old, he knows he's really poor, and he just wears it with dignity because he knows the sacrifice that he has made by staying in Derry, but that sacrifice has kind of enhanced him with this strength. And it's very nuanced, it's very subtle, but it's there. And Mike's the one who tells everybody, I know you don't remember, but you will. And there's just straight confidence flying out of this guy. Confident, dignified, strong, prepared, ready. And overall, I don't blame Isaiah Mustafa on this. I blame the script. 
I felt poor choices were made. Also, another hot take. Why are we obeying these mysterious visions Bev has that no one but her has seen, and she's never said anything up until they're all together? In It Chapter 1, Bev is taken down into the sewer. She sees the dead lights. She's floating in this hypnotic trance. And then in It Chapter 2, the reason why they remain in Derry instead of fleeing when everyone gets freaked out is Bev says, I've seen us all die. And if we don't defeat him, we're going to die in the way that I saw. But we don't see any of those visions. And what I don't like about that is shouldn't saving the children in Derry be enough? Like, why do their motivations have to come from a selfish place? Because they all conclude, I don't want to die in the way Bev saw in her vision, so I guess I'll stay and fight the monster. Kind of doesn't work and it cheapens it a little bit. And then there's the stupid leather bucket. Ugh. I'm not bashing the tribal connection it has to the ritual of Jude, and I understand that the director had to make the biting of tongues portion more digestible to a viewing audience. I get that. I get that. But props aren't necessary. The leather bucket, the tokens are stupid and not needed. What's wrong with just confronting the monster and killing it? Why do we have to have this elaborate rigmarole? (laughs) I just don't understand why they added things to King's story rather than just use what you've got. You've got 1,100 pages, buddies. Why are we adding stuff that never existed? I'm okay with omitting. I'm absolutely fine with chopping things out because you can't fit them in. But what I'm not cool about is interpolation, where you're just plugging in things that never were, ever, and rolling with them. That's what I don't like. I get it, you have the rights, you're adopting it, but man, I was disappointed. This thing is sacred. This story is holy. (laughs) Why are you making things up? So sadly, all those little things I just mentioned casually, heatedly, I believe it hindered the overall success and score, the tally of the film. I definitely enjoy watching it. I love Stephen King adaptations, no matter what form they take. But I think I'm just the most pissed off about Mike. I felt anybody who plays Mike has a real opportunity to show strength rather than weakness. After all, this character has been forged in the fire. By living in Derry all these years, he is made of stone. This guy is not weak. He's been hardened by dread and by pain, and therefore, Mike is the wise sage now. He's at the helm of the ship. He's the organizer. He's the leader. And I think that's why King has Bowers stab Mike in the novel, because he is so integral to their success. All of Mike's leadership and wisdom went out the window when he gets stabbed, and that left the Losers Club completely vulnerable and at the mercy of Pennywise. I wish they would have granted Mike that strength of character and dignity and that Tim Reed's performance could have been echoed. Had that happened, we might have had a much stronger film. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know about all that, but I can hope. But like I said, I appreciate the new It chapters. They're very spooky. I love the costume design and makeup for Pennywise. Bill Skarsgård's performance is compelling and haunting. And it's really checking boxes with the creep out factor and providing the jump scares. So overall, I'm pleased that its incarnation is the wide open door that keeps beckoning people to read this amazingly complex, perfectly imperfect novel and letting these characters live forever. That's all I want to say about the films. Perhaps down the road there might be more thoughts and definitely larger deep dives where I'd like to discuss all three acts, all the characters, a bunch more stuff. But for now, Let's do a big, 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 big recap on everything we've covered in this very long episode. We started out with Mike's Time to Shine, the Dairy Interludes, What's with All the Italics, 
Then we explored my complex and tender feelings for Beverly Marsh. We had a little bit of sex talk in there, as well as echoes of different seasons. And can someone go get Eddie? We then had the Eater of Worlds, concluding with the 1990 miniseries and It Chapter 2 from 2019. I think that will wrap things up for now. We did it, everybody. Thank you all so very much. If you listened to this whole thing, wow. If you did the whole thing, props to you. If you made it halfway, that's great too. I appreciate it. I know this episode is a bit more raw. It's a bit brazen and open and personal because that's exactly what I wanted it to be. And I hope it worked out. If not, that's okay. We'll live to fight another day. But as always, with this epic masterwork, there is lots more to say. Maybe there will be more episodes discussing the many things I didn't touch on down the road. But this is, as I mentioned previously, very different from our normal programming, but it is a special book and required a different recipe, so please stick around and explore some other episodes to observe our usual routine But if you made it this far, thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. Coming up next on the show, we're going to continue this wild and wacky 2023 schedule with a return to Jerusalem's Lot. The next episode will be Salem's Lot. Hopefully I'll have it done before Halloween. Ooh, fingers crossed. I'm going to super duper try my best, but it might be a little late. But you guys know me, always late, but worth the wait but it's happening. 100%. It's going down. Ben Mears and Barlow coming at you. If you haven't yet subscribed and left a review of the show and you've been listening for a little while, it would be a wonderful early Halloween treat for me. It would definitely give me a nice gust of wind beneath my wings because I'm going to be honest, guys, this one took some energy and some sweat and I need to build my strength back up, and hearing from all of you really helps with that. Feel free to locate me on Instagram, threads, X, and of course, the show's email, which is underrated, sk at gmail. I would love for you guys to write in if you haven't. Let me know what you think about these episodes. Let me know about your history with King, any questions you have, any thoughts you'd like to share. I respond early and often, and I would love to hear from you. Thank you once more for spending some time with me in these dairy streets and sewers. Please take care wherever you are, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.